Incredibles 2 is a huge film. <laughs> There's so much super stuff in this film. It's like spy movies, action, comedy. Put all those things into a big caramel candy corn. And that's, you know, this movie. We all love the original. So everyone on this crew came with a sense of tremendous responsibility to do even better on this one. The world is bigger than Incredibles 1. The original film was kind of a 50s-ish aesthetic. We wanted to push it forward a bit to 62-ish. Our design language is from the point of view of somebody from that time envisioning what the future might look like. But it's very much rooted in that modernism, you know, of the 60s. We call it retro-futurism. In the world of The Incredibles, we have this rule, and that is that you never do something fantastic very long without doing something mundane. They do live a normal life. So in the house, the mundane part of it is Bob being at home with the kids and do things like feed them breakfast and put them to bed and do homework, but he's doing so in this evil villain lair type mansion. The house is this new life that they're being promised that's initially kind of dazzling, but also causes a lot of problems. And I thought that's a really great thing that they're uncomfortable in this place. There's things like this big rock intruding into the room. There's water going through the house furniture that you can manipulate with a remote control. When Dash gets a hold of the controls and the floor just keeps opening and closing in different places to create these indoor pools, it's a nightmare if, if it was in real life and you had kids. For story, that's perfect. No, no, no. Screen Slayer interrupts this program for an important announcement. My favorite thing that I've worked on was the Screen Slayer's Lair. The lair is the dark side of Evelyn. She is an inventor. She likes to create new things from existing things. You know, you might see a typewriter, and she's kind of wired all that stuff into a monitor or a TV screen. Her thing is about manipulating people through screens. We get to really see the inner workings of her brain. In the process of designing that environment, I got to really tap into that sociopathic kind of uh, mind state. Screen Slayer. So of course you can't have a supervillain without a ton of people to save. So there's a lot of people in the background, a lot of characters. The purpose of a background character is to make the world that you're in feel populated. So they need to look like they fit in with a very stylized world. So our background characters had to be very stylized as well. But they can't draw enough attention that you're focusing on the extra in the background. They're really cool looking characters. They're interesting, but not too interesting. What was really exciting about the background characters on the show is the diversity. We were so excited to get to focus on diversity in so many different ways. There are people across the spectrum of age. There are people across the spectrum of skin color and body types. We designed a wardrobe that was interchangeable, a lot of circle skirts and blouses, pencil skirts and wiggle dresses, and for the men, really nice fitting suits, slacks. It's New Urban, right? So it's a bustling city full of people going and walking around the streets. Some of the characters that are in the background we elevated to be characters that are front and center, like the makeup woman, for example, who touches up Helen before she goes on TV. They're all really dynamic and beautiful and fun to watch. And that really helps to ground out the world and kind of steep you in the time. Brad's movies are huge. He loves everything. We had to come up with these really super cool vehicles. Let's stop a train. <laughs> Let's stop a boat. Let's stop some helicopters. 
I like Underminer's driller. This vehicle is completely over the top, so it's, you know, tunneling beneath the earth, running down the street. It's my favorite vehicle. The last cycle is my favorite. I loved the idea from the second Brad had written it on the page, but it wasn't fully realized until I saw drawings from Bob Paul, and he showed how this thing could twist and turn and go through traffic. The bike splits from her logo, and she can move these two pieces completely independently. And then on her handlebar, she can instantly pull them back together. Because it's just a great way to kick off Helen's resumption of her hero duties. And she does it with such happiness, you know? Good luck, honey, with the baby. I'm out of here on my super cool motorcycle. Wait a minute, is that Elastigirl? That's Elastigirl. The jet that Evelyn escapes in, in the movie, it comes off the top of the Hydroliner. And it actually was a secondary thought because we designed the Hydroliner and in designing the top part of it, we all started to realize that maybe it looks like something because it had these wings coming off of it. It's some of the most unique design we've done on the film and it's absolutely appropriate for The Incredibles. What it's like is coming back to all the things that I loved at the age of 10 or 12. If the film is being done right, every single aspect of costuming, color, sound, everything tells you something about the world and the characters that inhabit it.